Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. Today we have the privilege of speaking to Coach Danny Haney. Danny Haney played his high school ball at Lexington Catholic High School in Lexington, Kentucky before playing at Eastern Kentucky. From there he coached at Lexington Catholic and got Lexington Catholic up to as high as number three in the USA Today National Poll. He has sent hundreds of players to colleges at all levels and now he works at Windermere Prep in Orlando, Florida. And uh, he also... Uh, helped get Finley Prep started and off the ground. So this is a great episode. Full disclosure, Danny was my high school coach at Lexington Catholic, and without him, I'm not playing Division One basketball. He really changed the course of my life, so it's a very, very high honor to talk to him today. And also, we talk about a few topics, such as you know, how do you build a program to get them up to be number three in the country? Um, you know, what's it like coaching Rick Pitino and Tubby Smith's kid? He turned down two-time NBA All Star that could have joined his team. Why did he do that? Um, he also talks about, uh, you know, learning how to do his press system from Rick Pitino, being in a room with Adolf Rupp and Bobby Knight, and as well as he was there at the foundation of Finley Prep, which without Finley Prep, there are no prep school uh, basketball academies in America right now. So it was a great conversation, uh, a lot of good logic. He also, you know, has a son who played at Florida State and was a successful pitcher there. So we hear his perspective as a coach and a parent. So if you like this, go ahead and subscribe uh, and all the major uh, podcasting platforms in YouTube uh, and tell a friend about it and uh, let me know if you've got any questions or comments. So thanks so much. Enjoy the show. Danny Haney, welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe, maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting, like, oh, yes, yeah, somebody wants me. All right, Danny, welcome to the show today. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you on. Um, I want to start out by saying that you were a very good high school player back in the day at Lexington Catholic. And in fact, you were one of the leading scorers of all time until your players eventually passed you, um, which I know is a, a funny story in itself. But uh, tell me, what, what was that drive you had that made you want to be such a good player? Where'd that come from? You know, it, it was just growing up where I did. I, I played all sports like everyone, but I, I've, I've struggled a lot of times finding, you know, eight or nine to play baseball or football. And, you know, basketball go, you grab a ball and you just go out and play. And uh, so I just really, really got into that really heavy because of that, because I could uh, just, you know, I didn't have somebody push me. It was just me being close to a basketball goal and growing up in a family that, you know, had eight of us in a 1200 square foot home with one bathroom. And but it was across the street from a Catholic school and a, a church and a park. So I was I was in good shape. And you ended up playing at Eastern Kentucky. Why pick yeah. Eastern? What was your decision making process on that? Well, I know I was on the list for Kentucky only because I was a local kid and they had to, but I actually saw the list and there was, there was uh, 12 and I was number 12 and they had six scholarships. And back in the day, they were going to get their top six, but in high school, I had to play like a lot of kids out of position. So I, I had to play in the, in the post, uh, but I did handle the ball a lot. And obviously when I was going to go to college, I was going to have to be converted to a point guard. So um, I actually, verbally committed to Iowa State because one of the assistants at the University of Kentucky got the head job, Len Nance, at Iowa State. And uh, it probably the story went that Kentucky said, get him out of town. Uh, so myself and a kid from Louisville both went out there and it was different back in, in the mid seventies. That league wasn't like it is now. Um, you know, it was a, a bunch of, bunch of kids from Iowa and, uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, Max Good became who we both know very well. Max became the assistant coach at Eastern Kentucky and, and called me and said, look, uh, I'm going to be there. And Bobby Washington, who, who I knew very well, was an All-American at Eastern and a great high school coach and, and player in Lexington area. Those two are going to be named the two assistants. So I jumped on it right away because I knew those guys. I, I was a player when they were coaching high school in the Lexington area and they were two of the toughest teams you ever had to compete against. So that's, that's the main reason. It was close to home, like a lot of things. Yeah. Okay. And then you ended up after doing that, going back to Catholic, why did you want to get into high school coaching? Well, you know, I didn't know that was going to be my path. I got, I got hurt uh, in college and I'm like every high school kid. I thought I was going straight to the league, you know, uh, cause I, you know, again, I 
I scored a lot of points and, and, but again, I haven't been exposed nationally. There wasn't the recruiting things and there wasn't a lot of that out there, but the first day I got on college and I met my other 14 teammates, I said, Oh Lord, I better get into the class. Mm -hmm. So that, that changed it real quick. I knew that uh, I had to do some things. And then the coaching part really happened mainly, you know, I got hurt and I ended up having three knee surgeries through college. I started as a freshman not on a very good team. And then they really got some good players in. And, uh, and then I think, you know, I look back all the time of getting hurt, honestly, could have been the best thing for me. It's not good for my knees now, but it gave me the opportunity to my senior year to become a student assistant. Uh, and then I got to be in all the meetings. I got to be at all the practices. I got, I had to be there for the morning discipline of the players that stayed out late, my teammates. Right. So I, I got, I got a chance to see all that. And then, Back then, uh, I was able to recruit. So I, I spent a lot of days in the car with Coach Good mm. going to recruit the, the Kentucky kids. So all of a sudden, I just became a big passion for me. And then actually ending up in my alma mater, Lexington Catholic, was not the plan. I was going to do the college scene. And uh, the coach at Lexington Catholic had a, had a serious uh, surgery that put him out for a couple of years. And the priest had called and wanted to know where I was academically. And you know, and I was a P major and took some summer classes. So I, I actually went back for as a, as a JV coach and a teacher for four or five years. Uh, but I still had that itch a little bit to, to do the college. And then I left for a year uh, when Max became head coach and went and worked as a part-time assistant. And then all of a sudden I was recruiting all the time because I was allowed to back, you know, 45 years ago. But then I was never at practices. And, of course, you want to be part of a Max Good practice, mm -hmm. you know, things you're going to learn from him. And, you know, I'm still trying to learn. And so I, I was taken away from the day-to-day -day practices, which I love. I bet I didn't see four of Eastern's games that year. And uh, so then I said, you know, I want to get back with, with the kids that I can. And, and that's what took me back to Lexington Catholic for the next 15 years. A couple of questions on that real quick. Was Dan Patrick at Eastern when you were there? He had just left when I got there. Okay. Because yeah. he likes to lament about his time there quite a I bit. I think he was, yeah, I think he was there a couple of years, right? And, and transferred to Dayton, maybe. Okay. I think he was to Dayton, yeah. Um, who, who was the other guy that was there at one time? Uh, oh, uh, the $6 million man. Uh, oh, you, Lee, uh, Lee uh, Majors. Lee, Lee Majors. He played football there and actually owned one of the establishments there called the Family Dog that I used to go to every once in a while. Oh, that's pretty neat. Uh, let, let me ask you this. You spending all that time on the road recruiting, how did that help you as a high school coach? You know, it, it really did. It, it helped me a lot to um, see and talk to parents who mainly thought maybe their kid was at a level they weren't at. And, and it really helped me, you know, I knew when I became a head coach that I wanted to always be honest to my players, whether they appreciate it or the parents, but I think you had to be honest. And I know the line of work you're in, I think it's very critical for us as high school coaches or mentors to, to not lead them wrong. You know, again, everyone wants to play division one, right. And, and I had to have those hard calls and decisions with a lot of players to tell them, here's where I personally think you should play because and I know we'll get into that, but it's it's uh, it's critical for kids to go where they can play. Um, you know, obviously there's there's I'm a big component. If you can, you know, it's the what you do four years takes care of the next forty years. So there are some of those schools that can help you in a, in a lot of ways. A Notre Dame, for instance, you know the the connections you're going to make. Um, but also, kids aren't happy if they're not playing. So I think it was critical. And, and that's what I loved about the high school thing. We really could make an impact on someone's life and, and help them with that path. Yeah, and I want to get personal real quick and just let the, the listeners know. So I started out at a high school in Kentucky in Lexington and then transferred halfway through my sophomore year to play for you at Lexington Catholic. And one of the reasons we did that was we knew – you know, you knew how to talk to college coaches and now actually finding out that you did that for a year. Now it all makes sense to where you told coaches about me, like, Hey, Corey's not going to help us now, but he's a player that's going to get much better exponentially in college, which turned out to be the case. But 
I don't know many high school coaches that that have that expertise that you might have had. Now, the prep school coaches have that because they're placing sure. kids every year. They're being blunt with them. But just um, I think that's something that was special. And, I, you know, that year on the road probably really helped you do that and hone that skill. And, you know, since you were around the state of Kentucky so much, Danny, um, going to all these hollers, seeing these good players, I have been an advocate for Kentucky basketball for a long, long time because I've gotten out of the state. I've coached in different parts of the country. And, um, you know, when I got in this business, the first eight kids I sent to post-grad year, most of them for, were from Kentucky, and seven of those guys went D1. So there's a lot of talent in the state that just doesn't get seen. But why don't you share with folks that might not know about Kentucky basketball or Kentucky high school basketball, what makes it so special? Well, you know, I, I've been in Florida for 20 years, and, and I told when I got down here, you know, Billy Donovan changed the way Florida basketball was. He started putting clinics on and things, and – a lot of folks just come down here and, and, and want to coach or they did back when. And, and I told him, you know, when, when I was in Kentucky, I don't care who you were playing. I don't care if it was Redbird in Corbin, Kentucky or Bergen in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. I'm, I'm just going small market. We had to have a scouting report on every opponent we played. You could never take anyone lightly because, first of all, you're going to get out coached in Kentucky. These guys mm -hmm. prepare uh, they dress properly. They're they have great game management. Uh, you know, Kentucky basketball's always been able to. You know, you go to a clinic, whether it was, whether it was Adolph Rupps back in my day, or Joe B. Halls, or Eddie Subs. It doesn't matter. You were always going to learn, and it was going to be sold out. Six, seven hundred coaches. You know, not only did I that I go, I would bring eight coaches with me to clinics, and that's all we did was clinics. You know, and I said I don't care if we come out of here with one thing. You know, but, it, you know, maybe, you know, the way I always saw clinics was that, you know, it, it's it, to see if what we're doing is, is kind of what's out there. So that's what made Kentucky so special. The, uh, the fundamentals was just unbelievable. And they still are. We, I run a tournament down here in Florida uh, in the Orlando area, and I always have two or three Kentucky teams. And on Patriots, I will coach I think five foot 11 centers. It doesn't matter. You better be ready because they're going to take you to the wire and they're going to outcoach you and outsmart you. And um, I never, you know, I could go through, you know, there are a few coaches in Kentucky that I just thought was on a pedestal, uh, but, but they're all good. Very good. Yeah. When I coached the Gonzaga, uh, the coach there said, Hey, you got a Kentucky team you want to bring in? I said, yeah, we'll bring in Mike Mendenhall and Lafayette. <laughs> and they were the playing game for Gonzaga's own, you know, marquee tournament. And Lafayette beat him. And that, the, my coach was pissed at me for six months. I said, I warned you. I warned you that this was going to happen. And it, it was beautiful seeing well, – was, it was contradictory, but beautiful seeing my own te old teammate, a Lexington team, just put it to a team with eight D1 guys on their home court in their home tournament. And uh, I just kind of said, I, I told you guys. Well, it, it, and I tell people all the time, it's really what built our program at Lexington County. We had an unbelievable staff, but actually – your father, who, when you transferred, you know, I learned a lot actually from your father. Obviously, your father, you know, played and his brothers played and his nephew played. And so it was a very, you know, Indiana. So there's, there's two places, Kentucky and Indiana, when I was growing up. And, and your, your father actually helped me um, get an event in the Great Alaska Shootout back when the high school, of course, you were there. We did it, you know, around the Thanksgiving time. And it taught us how to travel. You know, get on an airplane, go eat at restaurants, do all the right thing, the proper sleep, things we weren't doing before. And we got beat. We got beat really good. You know, Trey Jalang didn't play the dude. They, they laid it on us, and then we had to go eat Thanksgiving with them. So, right. uh, but I, I learned a, a tremendous a lot from that. From that time on, we started traveling every year when nobody was traveling. And I don't care if it was if we went to Hawaii or if we went to the Bahamas or if we went up to Vegas, wherever – we started now competing in these tournaments uh, and it all, you know, it helped us too. You know, we, we got sponsorships through Nike and some things, but our kids learned how to play and then they wanted to be part of that. And, uh, uh, you know, I said, every time we went out there, it was like, you know, after those first couple of years, we, we were playing for, you know, we were always in the hunt for the championship of one of those tournaments. And again, that's probably what led me to Florida. You know, we, we were coming down here every year, whether it's the Cruel Classic or the Great Florida Shootout. Uh, still have great contacts with all those people. And, 
and they would see our kids walk in with their blue bla blazers and khakis and their ties and say, look, these guys can't play. And then when the ball went up, these kids could play. You know, they, uh, you know, in Kentucky, you're going to have, which is, which is a lost start. You don't get this in Florida at most schools, but we, we started with our foundation. We started with our middle school program. So by the time Coach Mendenhall got through them, all I had to do was go to page two of my playbook, you know, because these guys were running the same out-of-bounds plates, the same, you know, I told them, here's what we're going to do. Here's our presses. Here's what we're going to do. And by the time I got them, they'd already played, my God, 200 games through their middle school season. You know, they were playing 60, 70 games going anywhere to play. So it really what built our program. It wasn't about – you know, this kid or that kid, it was just the foundation of the, of the middle school program. And you don't get that in Florida and you don't get that a lot of places because kids transfer around so much. What made you come up with that idea? Well, I, you know, again, being a product of, of, you know, I went through the Catholic grade school and, and we always just played in a little parochial league. But I knew, you know, when you're an assistant coach five years, there's things you kind of like to do your own way. I had great mentors, uh, you know, and I just felt that I played in that league and I just thought, what if I took the best combination of players? I mean, we would have 80, 90 kids try out for, you know, 15 kids on the eighth grade and 15 on the seventh, whatever. But the key was not only that, but finding the right person, finding Mike Mendenhall, who was a parent eventually never showed his parents' side. You know, he loved kids. He loved working and did it free. Mike Mendenhall never got a check. Not 20-some years he's still coaching. So all those guys that I had, they we made them feel part of it. When I won or lost at the high school level, they felt that pain. So they felt part of the Lexington Catholic tradition. And, again, we, we were big in tradition, um, learned a lot about fundraising, again, from your dad. You know, he taught me a lot of little things that – that really helped me in my career of fundraising. You know, I, again, eventually I got out of teaching and got into the fundraising part at the high school. And, you know, if you, if you believe in where you're at, it's easy to do those things. And we, we love, we love the school. We love the community. And so that, that was an easy part for us. Yeah. And another thing I want you to explain about Kentucky basketball is the high school tournament at the end. And I know you haven't been there in 20 years, yeah. but tell me about what makes Kentucky in uh, their high school tournament so special at the end of the year? Well, there, there's, again, there's nowhere like it. You know, Indiana was the, the last, there was two, two states left with a, a one school, one tournament uh, champion and Kentucky is it now. Uh, you know, there's 340 high schools and it comes down to, um, you know, one state champion. There's no classifications. Uh, we played in front of the largest crowd ever of, you know, who plays in front of 23,000 in a high school tournament. So, you know, I never missed a state tournament probably from the third grade up growing up, you know, a, a mile from Rupp Arena. So that was always your ultimate goal to get there, right? And that was always our goal at Lexington Catholic. And, and they had been previously, you know, three times over a 30-year period and, 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 and lost the first round. But it was still just coming out of our region, which we felt was the toughest region in the state of Kentucky when you're with five major public schools with two to 3,000 students, and you're with a little Catholic school of 500, you know, and, and mainly kids in there. But that, that tournament alone, Corey, as you well know, people make their, their vacation around it from the mountains. People come from all over Eastern Kentucky. They take that week, because they're gonna make you stay five nights at a hotel, whether you come for a game or not, and then they decide who they're gonna cheer for. Their team may not be there. But they come to Lexington, they spin there, and they, they're as knowledgeable as, as the coaches on the floor. So trust me that wherever you go, everyone is pretty knowledgeable of the game of basketball. And that's what really made it special. You know, it's funny because we went to uh, – I think we played twice in Indiana, and it was uh, – Where's Larry Bird? We're, we were at where Larry Bird High School was, and they had a, a Bobby Knight's son ran an event there. And we went down there. It's the first time, I think, outside of my first two years of coaching that I ever we that we ever lost back-to-back -back games. I mean, once we started going, we 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 just, you know, and 
Indiana, it was a little bit different. They want to play in the 50s and 60s, and I want, as you know, want to play in the 90s. And, boy, those guys, uh, they can coach in Indiana too. So, uh, But now it's, you know, a lot of people out there. And it's funny, we get a lot of guys from Kentucky to move to Florida, and they're hired pretty quick. You know, the, mm-hmm. I think some of these school systems know, hey. And I remember coming down here – playing in a, the big term at one time and college coaches there. And I had a little point guard. I won't throw any names out, but I had a little point guard once that I want your kid. And I said, he can't play at your level. He said, coach, you don't get it. He said, I got kids that play above the square. I've got the athletes. I just don't have somebody that understands the game like your kids understand the game. So mm-hmm. our kids that, you know, there was always a place for our kids and, and there was a lot of work. You know, we had to, if, if kids are willing to go somewhere, as you well know, there's a school for them. I've never felt there's not a place for them. You know, a lot of that is taking away from the high school coaches now with travel and club. Coaches don't have as much input as, I mean, it all went through our office. I mean, when a coach came in, well, now they need other outside resources. Again, what you're doing uh, with the post-grads is phenomenal. There's such a need for that right now. You know, you were the first one that I coached that actually went that route. And I studied that because I wanted to make sure that I wasn't help leading you down the wrong path either. You know, I know you you had family that very knowledgeable about sports uh, that were helping also. But it was an unbelievable experience for you. Yeah, life changing. And I, th- I don't know. I think Lawrenceville School via Rick Patino came and talked to me and we had no idea about that, nor did we know until the military academy started reaching out to us. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we all learned in that one. It was life changing. But um, one last thing I want to say about the tournament in the state of Kentucky is actually a few years ago, it was, it was Hoosiers incarnate because you had a small mountain team with all white kids playing yeah. a giant uh, urban team from Louisville. And I, I don't remember who won, but it was Hoosiers and it, that can't happen anymore with the class system. So it is a special thing. I know uh, yeah. there's great basketball everywhere, but you don't see the fanaticism and the passion. And like you said, the knowledge of the fans. Like I lost my Kentucky. first state championship in 1992 was the first time we went, but we had beat this team earlier in the year. It's called University Heights. And they were a school of 54 students coached by Jeff Jackson, who's now at Lincoln County, just a great coach and a friend but they were loaded. I had two kids that signed to Tennessee with Kevin O'Neill. We had beat them earlier in a small little tournament by seven and they turned around for the championship game. It was, it was probably the least watch. It was actually in freedom hall. It was probably the least watched high school state tournament ever because Kentucky was playing Duke at the same time. And I'll never forget this. I could, I, I, I'll never forget this as long as I live. We were within about a minute of the game. We ended up losing by two. And all of a sudden, I hear my assistant coach, Coach Houston, say something to somebody and said, what happened? Well, Sean Woods just scored. They're talking about Kentucky just scored. And I go, we're playing for a state championship. There's only 5,000 people in the stands. Everybody's upstairs watching the TV, and that's when Chris Leitner hit a shot. And all of a sudden, it was like nobody really cared. Right. And I, you know, I just lost, we just, or we just lost the, the state championship on a last second shot by University Heights, but oh, everybody cared about the Kentucky and Duke game, 1992. <laughs> what an experience. Infamous memory right there. Yeah. Uh, when you were coaching at Lexington Catholic, you had the privilege to coach uh, Rick Patino's son and Tubby Smith's son. That's some high pressure right there. What, what are the pros and cons of coaching uh, eventual Hall of Famers kids on a, in a program? But, you know, it was thing. Well, when Coach Patino came, you know, it, to me, he was, you know, t- to this day, probably one of the best on the floor coaches I've ever been around. And I took advantage of it. You know, we were starting to press. We weren't very good at it. And I asked Coach, I said, hey, could I come to some practices? And he said, yeah, here's what we practice. So I switched all my practices tonight at nighttime and I went to every practice. And of course, think of his staff back then, Corey, yeah. Billy Donovan. Tubby Smith, Herb Sendek, uh, Winston Bennett, whose son played for me. And eventually he had Ralph Willard. And I mean, Billy Donald was 23 years old. I would sit in an office afterward and we would move little magnet things on the presses. So I learned a lot of our presses. We were doing it, but obviously the things he was doing was unbelievable. And then he had Jim O'Brien, you know, Jim O'Brien, who's the son-in-law of the great uh, Dr. Jack Ramsey. 
you know, who, you know, and Jim went on to coach the Celtics and went with Rick. So at one time I had Coach Patino's son, Jim O'Brien's son, and Winston Bennett, who was a great player at Kentucky, all three on the same team. And then they went to the Boston Celtics together. And then, of course, when I had Tubby, you know, we're, we're still very, very close. And uh, his son that played for me is, is, was coaching for us also. Uh, but none of them ever, you know, we, you know, because your parents had to, we had a rule. Our parents had to work three concessions. And I do know Coach Patino worked once, but I know his wife, Joanne, always jumped in the concessions. And Donna Smith, they, they had to work concessions for us because that's how we raised money, through concessions, running our tournaments. We had a massive tournament, as you well know. But we didn't treat them any different, nor did they want to be treated any different. And, uh, you know, so it was – honestly, I, I took – I took advantage of it. I never asked for tickets, never asked for anything special. All I wanted to do was learn and going to sit at their practice. And, and they were two different. You know, Tubby was unbelievable with big men. You know, he loved the big six, ten, seven footers type of guys. And as Joe Hall did, you know, the Rick Roby and, and the Mike Phillips and all the big guys and, and your, your uncle. You know, he loved the big kids. And Coach Patino, he loved, He was more into the athleticism, the guys that can do a little bit of everything. And that's more the type of kid that I was coaching at Catholic, you know. So um, I get people all the time want me to send the presses. I still do. I literally two weeks ago, I haven't coached in 10 years, and I just sent our presses out to a coach in Kentucky, mind you. Um, you know, coaches, again, they come to the state tournament. You have an out-of-bounds place at work please draw that up for me, send it to me. So we still do that. We talked to a lot of people, but, you know, I took our presses and, and again, learning from Coach Patino and, and Billy Donovan and those guys, you know, again, Billy was 22, 23 years old. Look where he's at now. And those guys, you know, they look, they were getting at the office at 435 in the morning. They had a rule. First of all, they had to play. They had to play before they, and then they would get there. And those guys were, they work very, very hard. And uh, um, so that that's kind of what – that's answering your question long term. I loved it. I never had one of them ever talk about playing time. We had a very strict rule. We didn't discuss playing time, coaching strategy, or our philosophy, you know, because, again, the style that we played, as you well know, you know, after about five or six minutes of the game, we're already subbing. We have a cycle going. We would play 11 kids by the end of the first quarter. And that's where the press really helped us. It, when you have a lot of kids, you know, typically all programs have three or four kids. It's a little above the rest. And then when you start getting to, you know, player five through four, there's not a lot of difference. The problem is you got to find, you got to play, you know, find playing time for them. And nobody wants to practice and not play and, that's where the press has really helped me when I went all in. You know, Kevin O'Neill's a great friend of mine, and Kevin used to say, you pick one thing and do one thing really good. And there was a lot of things we didn't do good, but, but the pressing, we decided this is what we're going to – we put it in the fifth grade, the sixth grade, the seventh grade, and the eighth grade. They had no choice. They were going to press 24-7. Matter of fact, Scotty Davenport, the coach at Bellarmine, he was the great coach at Ballard High. And when I, I, I've never seen anyone do what he did. He coached Allen Houston and he would press two, two, one out of, out of free throws, miss free throws. They would stay up on you and I actually went down. He was already at, at Louisville coaching. And I was here and I said, coach, talk to me how you set that up. So we had a lot of discussions how he ran it. Of course he had some really good players, but he was unbelievable. So we started pressing, it didn't matter if you're going to shoot a free throw, we're, we're pressing on a made or a miss. And there was a lot of strategies that, that came with it, but uh, uh, it really helped me play a lot of kids, get a lot of kids in. I mean, we never ever subbed on a mistake ever. I don't believe in that. We sub strictly on fatigue or situational stuff. Yeah. And a couple of notes on that. When we were there, it was, we went 10 or 11 deep. And the first five would be in there, go hard, and then bam, we would do a, a whole line change, and five new guys came in hungry, mad we weren't starting, mad at the other team, and then it just was it was relentless. And it was just such a fun system playing. Not everyone can do that, obviously, if they don't have the talent of the system, but that was fun. And then secondly, talking about Patino, you know, I was there when Mike Patino uh, was on the team, and that's when Rick could have been the governor of Kentucky. That's how popular he was. And, and we would go places, and Mike would be mobbed, 
with autograph seekers. And Mike was also the last guy on the bench. Um, and when he would get in, people would go nuts. So, you know, that was kind of a circus you had to deal with. And then when I was at Lexington Christian, we had, you know, Coach Calipari's son on our program, and he couldn't come to a game without being hassled either. So it's just being a coach of Kentucky and, and being the son of a coach, uh, you know, the Kentucky coach. I got invited to two tournaments you typically don't get invited to that's, I mean, pays everything because of Michael Patino. Because they knew that, and, and Rick, if, if he could, he was going to be at his son's game, whether he got in or not. I mean, that was, you know, that's just what he did. So they knew, and we played in the great Florida shoot. No, we were down in Miami playing Miami senior when they had Haslam and those great players, Anthony Grant and Shaky Rodriguez was the coach. And they were number one, two team in the country. And we lost to them in overtime, but, Coach Patino was, you know, he had to fly out right there and he had to leave in overtime to get to where he was going for, for the UK game. Uh, but he, he was down there and people, as you well said, you know, they, they would say, oh, there's Mike Patino. You know, they wanted autographs, you know, just a little bit. And he was great with it. Now, Michael, liked it. He, he ate it up. <laughs> now, at one point you got up, you built the program up to where you were third in the nation, right? I think that was 98, 97 that year. Was that your fun that this is all coming to uh, all your players kind of all being peaking at the same time, your best players, or was there pressure on that year that wasn't enjoyable? Which was, no, it? you know, it was, it was really enjoyable. You know, again, back then, Corey, there was, there were more basic high school programs. There wasn't a lot of, of, of post-grads that were playing in these tournaments. There was only Oak Hill Academy. So there wasn't all the other stuff. So we were, you know, because I had these kids from the fifth, sixth grade up, and now you had some kids who were very talented, um, we wanted to play the best. Matter of fact, I, I begged to play Oak Hill Academy. I, I tried for years to play DeMatha before Coach Wooden would, would retire. I knew he was retiring. So I ran a big event. And your dad actually was involved. We, we, we had the Memorial Coliseum. We sold right at 10,000 seats for it. And I brought in Oak Hill and DeMatha. And it was actually, it was, it was in the name of Adolph Rupp. I called, so Morgan, I said, I'm doing called the Adolph Rupp Classic. And he said, well, then I'm in. And I said, it's one game, play us. You know, we'll play each other. Uh, Carmela Anthony was in it. You know, Oak Hill was in it. Um, so we, it was just an unbelievable event, but who does just a regular Saturday afternoon, you know, for, you know, $10 a ticket and 10,000 seats, but we lost on a last second shot. Well, we actually had the last second shot against the Matha and, uh, what a, what a great opportunity to play them. You know, look, I studied the Matha too. You know, I wanted to be that, that Catholic school, you know, we were the only Catholic school in Lexington and there was only, you know, no, two other really good Catholic schools at the time. There's great ones now with Covenant Catholics on, but you had the St. X and Trinity up in Louisville. So I knew we had a chance to do some things. And so I used to call Coach Wooten all the time. You know, I bought all of his tapes. I had all of his books and all of the things, but I wanted to play him. And I also wanted to play Oak Hill Academy. I just wanted to, to see where that took us. So the year you're talking about, um, we at one time, again, we played Oak Hill. They were number one in the country. And we, we beat them up in, I believe it was up in Western, it was up in, uh, oh, the Hoop Fest up in Western Kentucky where they have 6,000 fans for a high school event. But we also got on a plane that morning and flew to Chicago to play, uh, what was it? Uh, Whitney uh, Young. Rick Richardson, Rick, uh, WT, or, or yeah, Whitney Young, who was also undefeated, Quentin Richardson team. And they had five kids on Division One, and we beat them. So back to back nights, and that it kept them from being national champs because that was their only loss of the year, you know. So it, it was, uh, you know, we we all we were getting to that point and want to play those guys, and you know, again, that helps your whole program. It helps your middle school program say, here's we're not going to back down. So, but again, you can play all those schools you want, but once you get to the state tournament, in Kentucky. You better be prepared for the, the school down the street just as well as you will Oak Hill Academy, you know, with all the athletes. So uh, that that's when we were getting there. And then all of a sudden, a lot of the prep schools started up. You started seeing prep schools all over the country. Yeah, and you of all these years you coached, at, uh, you know, Lexington Catholic and Windermere Prep, 
and North Broward, you know, you've had a lot of great players. What did those players possess, the really great ones that made them so special? They, they loved the game and they were coachable. They, you know, they more than anything, it wasn't their way. They were going to listen. They knew that we cared and we were going to do everything in our power to make them better and try to make them better. Remember, I got out right before the whole travel stuff started where, and again, there's nothing wrong with that. That's, it's not going in. That's where it's at. Uh, but, you know, if a kid wanted to get in the gym, you know, all my players knew that I got to work very early. And so if they wanted to get in the gym and shoot or stay late, we were going to be there. And, and you see that a lot in, in Kentucky kids. Their parents would sit out in the car and their parents would never get upset. They, you know, so-and-so wants to stay, you know, and I get, co- I see coaches now, Corey, that want to charge a kid for extra work. And that was just starting when I was getting out of coaching. I said, what do you mean you're charging for something, you know, to work with a child, you know, and I could never fathom that. I know that's a whole another thing with personal trainers and that's fine, but I, I couldn't imagine ever staying extra to work with the kid on his free throws or, or whatever. And, and sending them an invoice, you know, but, uh, but that, that's kind of where, you know, we, those kids just, they lived in the gym seven days a week. You know, I, it's funny because I tell people it's a little different in Florida. When I was in Kentucky, even on a, I lived very close to the school, but on Sunday, when I would go to church, I would tell my wife, Hey, I'm going to run by the school for a minute. Well, that would turn into a six hour day. So your, your days at a, at a school like that, you know, 18 hours was normal, especially when you, I worked in athletics too. So, but you, you never thought of, boy, it's funny. My, my son, yes, he's a real, he's a realtor in Orlando. And he said, yesterday, he said, dad, I just put in an 18 hour day. And I said, well, that's a normal day. You know, I never thought of, of, of keeping time on, on that kind of stuff. You just did it because kids wanted to be there. Yeah, Absolutely. Well, I, I asked a few people anything I should ask Danny on this podcast, and multiple people came back about this fun one. So it's a zinger. Are you ready for it? I'll throw it at me. You turned down a two-time NBA All-Star and Brad Miller to join your team, and uh, people want to know why that was. Not me. I promise you. I, 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 I'm not asking this. Full disclosure, that's my cousin who was leaving it's his high school. Full disclosure, and, and uh, it's funny because <laughs> I remember Coach Patino asking because – Again, Kentucky has very, very, very strict transfer rules, probably the strictest in the country. Now, I think past year with COVID, it relaxed. Yep. But up to then, you had to have a whole deal. And, and Brad was transferring. And I had never taken a transfer like that at the time. And, and as much as I wanted him, I mean, look, to win, I mean, I saw, I saw the ability in that kid right away. Coach, you know, I called him that night and said, hey, I, the kid that, you know, this one of the best passing big men I've ever been around. And of course, you know, with coach good and all that kind of stuff. But uh, yeah, I mean, I just, we, I just wasn't doing that. You know, I, uh, I don't regret it, but I would have loved to coach a kid like that. Cause obviously I hadn't coached one like him. I mean, I, I followed his career, you know, mainly, mainly after, you know, with your family and watching him and, what a remarkable career he had and the way he could pass the ball and shoot the ball and understood the game. But again, he's an Indiana kid, right? So that all made very much sense. Yeah. And that's the whole thing. There's no prep athletics today without you not taking Brad. If, if Brad wow. goes to you, he, we don't talk about Max good and he doesn't wow. go to prep school and, and this wow. and that. So that decision right there, you know, changed everything for our family in a good way. And we joke, it would have been weird for him to come mid season with our style, but yeah. uh, it's just funny. You can always claim like, Hey, I turned down an NBA all-star. Yeah. And look what, what happened to him. And again, you know, that's why the, what you're doing right now with the prep, I'm such a component of what you're doing, Corey, um, because especially what's happened here in the last few years, my son, again, my son's a student athlete at Florida state just graduated. He's probably, he was a six year student. He was a baseball player, six, six kid, got hurt his junior year, the, the year you get, potentially get drafted if you're a draftable athlete. And he had Tommy John. So he lost a year there, which was 18 months. And then when he came back, the, the COVID hit. And then all of a sudden, the, the MLB draft went from 42 rounds to five rounds. So it was just the elite of the elite. 
And he had a couple free agency deals and coach called and said, Hey, come back a year. You'll get the same deal. So he, he went back. I mean, Lord, he got, a, he got a, two masters, an undergraduate degree, but again, he was 25. Now think of what's going on. He graduated almost at 25 because he, you know, almost when you're in six years, that's, that's what's going to happen. Think what's going on now for a young kid, a high school kid trying to go directly to a college. I mean, I can't tell you how many six-year kids, and especially fifth-year kids, are playing right now. And that's why we have a kid that graduated, you know, here at Windermere Prep that's at Hargrave right now, seven-footer. Well, I've coached one seven-footer and another kid, but back then, out of 300 and, I don't know, let's say there's 340 Division ones, you get 280 offers. Well, that doesn't exist right now because of the transfer rule that's going on. You have the one-time transfer rule. I believe that's still in. And then the kids that can repeat. So this kid's now Hargrave, and now he, he didn't get the looks he did last year. With your help, where he's at now, he's getting looks from everyone. I mean, it would have been a shame for him. to Now Now he is a legit Division One prospect. He's getting another year. He's getting older, mature. You know, it's I'm probably getting off topic here, but we had a – a guest speaker here at our school, Windermere Prep, years ago. He, he has written three books, and I forgot his name, but it's called Raising Cain. It's about raising boys. And he said, let me tell you something. If you're only parents that came with ones that had boys, he said, I want to give you advice. He said, if you can hold your son back. Now, I'm not talking just about an athlete or whatever. Either hold him back, send him to a postgrad or whatever, get him another year of maturity. The advantage you will get is unbelievable. As we all well know, boys' bodies develop later. And I've had a lot of kids, 17 years old, that have gone on to college, and they just weren't there. You have to be bigger and stronger. And the growth rates you're going to have between your senior and freshman year of college is unbelievable. So I'm a massive component of sending them to post-grad. And, and again, just not because we're on this, but thank you for what you're doing, because you're helping out a lot of kids. A lot of families that don't know that they're all everybody wants to play division one, as we said earlier. Right. And and there is again, there is a place for every kid. You can be anywhere in the United States in an airplane in four hours. You know, if you're willing to go somewhere, grow up, live in a boarding, if it's a boarding house, get another year, work on your academics, work on your whole physical tool. Why not? Now, we all know the five-star athletes, right? They, we don't have to worry about who's recruiting them, but recruiting is a lot different now. Coaches are not coming to these high school games the way they used to. Mm -hmm. my, again, my son played at Florida State, one of the best baseball programs in the country. Never had a, a college coach step foot on this campus to watch him pitch or do anything in a baseball game. You know, it was all in the summer or word of mouth, mouth type of stuff, and that's the same thing with basketball so what what you're doing right now is is such a, a needed thing um you know and there are a lot of the academies popping up and and i know you do your research on where to send them and and it's critical to make sure that they they choose the right place but again you have to be honest and i have to be honest you know and and i ask our coaches to be honest to the parents they may not want to hear it because they all want to we're having seven kids sign here this afternoon at our school in different sports, you know, and it's, you know, it's just different. It's different than it used to be. Yeah. And you got to be flexible. You got to adjust with it. And COVID yeah. now that changed everything. And that put prep school back on the map for a lot of people that never realized it because prep schools could create their own bubbles, right? right. They could play other teams within a bubble uh, where a lot of kids lost the whole season. So it really picked up the last year. And uh, yeah, you're right. You got to be honest. And by being honest, there's a, I mean, I turned down, you know, 95% of the kids that reach out uh, to the prep school option. Cause it's just, it's not the right fit. Right. right. But yeah, because the coaches are taking, you know, they're taking your work and, you know, you've earned that national reputation now with these colleges, you know, or these prep schools. So they're going to, you know, you've got to make sure you're sending them the right kid too. You've got to be honest about that. And, uh, you know, again, anyone will take a seven footer. We know that. I mean, yeah. they're not everybody's seven foot. But again, the, the kids that I have seen that have gone on, that have gone on and got bigger and stronger and self confidence, whether it's working, you know, some of them used to have to go because of academic stuff. But, you know, 
I don't see that as much anymore. I see it more of the, the maturity of the body. And it's, you have to be ready. Kids are different now. They're just different. They're more athletic, but kids and the parent, they want their child to play. And it's very difficult coming right out of high school. I don't care what level you're at. It could be a division three. It's very difficult. You know, again, you're in this whole COVID thing. Corey has set this back for, I, it's got to be three to five years, the whole recruiting process and, and, the, and the way kids are going to play. I mean, I don't care if you're a female, all these kids that maybe they don't have opportunities to play professionally, they're getting their master's free on the school. That's what I told my son. Take mm -hmm. advantage of it. That was our whole goal when he went to college. It, we, I wanted to make sure that I didn't put any pressure. He never played travel baseball until his junior year. I wanted him to decide. He was a good basketball. I wanted him to decide who and what he wanted to be, not what I wanted him to be. And I wanted to make sure, number one, the main thing was get an education, period, you know, and meet people. Uh, again, we both know Max Good. And back when I played for those guys, you know, now I think it's a 20-hour practice week. I think we practice 20 hours a day. You know, there was no rules on practice. There's two a days and four days. And, and the only part I regret of 35, 40 years ago in college, I didn't really get to take advantage of college itself. I didn't get to know, go watch the tennis team or the baseball team. And I walk out the gym every day from practice and the baseball team is there. I never went and watch those guys play and, and got to know those players. And I, I begged my son to get involved in other things. And of course, after you're there five or six years, you get to know everybody, but he, I made sure, and he got involved with student athletes and organizations and things because of the monitoring of practice, you can do some of those things. And, and that's what I tell the kids, make your contacts. And these are people you remember for the rest of your life. And you know, I mean, you have reunions with the guys you played with. I do too. You know, 45 years later, I'm close with my former teammates, but not a lot of other students on campus because I just didn't partake in that. So that's when I talk to these kids and families, please, please get involved with other things outside of your sport because not everyone's going to play in the league. We all think we're going to play, but it's not just going to work out for everyone. Yeah, absolutely. You couldn't have said it better on that. One thing I want to mention too, you talk about playing time right? That parents and kids want. Now there's two ways a kid can go. And we're going to talk prep school here because that's my expertise in this. You know, some kids can go to a prep school and be the man and get a lot more minutes, or some can go to a prep school with 10 D one guys and be challenged every day. Maybe not, maybe not get much game time, but they'll get challenged every day. And the example I give on that actually is Lexington Catholic. And I give this to parents every time I talk to them to where I average two points a game, but I had to guard Vondale Morton, a six, six, top 100 player in the country every single day in practice. And those were hours of times battling with him, trying to score on him, trying to stop him. We actually played a lot of one-on-one -on -one when we weren't in practice. And when I got to Air Force, there was a kid from Idaho who scored 35 points a game, but was never pushed on a daily basis in practice, didn't know how to be physical. And I dominated him because even though he scored more points statistically, he wasn't used to the rigor of the, the grind every day. So I always tell parents, yeah, you can go to a place – and get more minutes and some kids need that Danny but do right. not be afraid of not playing as much in a post grade year game if you're guarding a mid major to high major oh, every no single day in practice so what are your thoughts on that if a parent says I want my kid to have playing time versus like the other situation well I would tell them exactly what you said you know you're only going to get better playing against better competition you know so that's why again I'm such a believer in in the post grad over going to a major D1 where it's not going to work out if, if, if you want to play right away, you know, uh, go to the post-grad, try to get big, bigger, stronger, and then you're ready to do that. Like I said, I mean, uh, you, 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 you hit the nail on the head. You were a perfect example of what you had to go through with the players. We saw the upside of you the day that I had you, but again, you needed that extra year. We always said, God, I wish he was a year younger. You know, you came in with some great players, but again, you got to practice and you got better. And then of course you got to take it to the, to that level in the post-grad and then it took your career off. So, yeah, I mean, don't, don't ever be afraid of that. I mean, it's, uh, you know, again, when my son went to Florida state, I, again, we never discussed playing time ever with them because they, 
they on an average average 12 kids a year to go to the uh, major league baseball. I mean, that's every year. So they recruit you saying, well, you'll only be here for three years because you're going to go pro. They right. can kind of see the young kid if they don't get hurt or whatever. So it was mainly he loved the school, loved the academics, but he loved the challenge of it. He said, I, I'm, I'm interested in that. And we sat there. It was really fun. I just sat there and crossed my leg. It's funny when, when you're a parent, though, because I went through it. I can coach in front of 23,000 and not be nervous. But when my son was pitching and he ended up actually, you know, he ended up breaking the all time record for the most appearances that that wasn't based on six years. That was in four years of appearances. He, they pitch him all the time because he was a specialty pitcher. My wife never watched him pitch. She always went to the bathroom. She couldn't stand to watch him pitch because you're, you know, you're pitching against Notre Dame, you're pitching North Carolina, you're pitching against the big boys. She couldn't take it. Well, me, it drove me crazy. I was as nervous, you know. Sometimes I didn't want him to pitch because there's more failures in baseball right. than there are the other ways. So, you know, basketball was easier for me because the kid makes a mistake, something happens, he can get down at the other end and, and stop somebody defensively, right? They can get a rebound. They can do something to offset it. You're a baseball pitcher. One pitch could change the game. And, and I saw many games that were changed in that. So uh, it was funny coming to Florida. They say, "Why? how in the heck did your son end up playing baseball? I said, well, it's, it's Florida. You know, they play year round here, you know, and it's uh, – uh, if, if we were in Kentucky, he would have – I, I wouldn't have told him not to, but he wouldn't even thought of the game of baseball. You know, it's just because we moved here at a young age and – Everybody was playing and they play a year round. We had a guy, Corey, when he, we moved here when he was six and I was in a park throwing a ball to him, doing a little stuff with him. And a guy came up and said, You're so, he was a big kid at six and said, he looks like he can play baseball. I said, we got a little travel team, but he can't play any other sports. So we all play over a hundred travel bait. I said, for six year olds, not sixth grade. I'm talking six year old. He said, oh yeah, this is when we were in Coral Springs. And I said, you got, I, I couldn't even believe that was going on because obviously in Kentucky, you're going to play football, basketball, and baseball. You move to a different climate. So I learned a lot about that world. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to be that parent. I've seen the burnout. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm going to let him decide, his body decide where it's going to go. So don't ever, don't ever, uh, you know, back down from the challenge. Yeah, absolutely. One last thing I want to talk about with you here is Finley Prep. Now, yeah. Finley Prep uh, was one of the first, if not the first, basketball academy out there. They had storied program, tons of NBA players, high majors, and you were there at the beginning of this. And since then, we've seen academies pop up all over the place. Um, in Colorado, in the past 18 months, we now have four academies have popped up. And, you know, Finley Prep kind of paved the way for that. So tell me a little bit about the inception and what the initial, the initial thought was on a pretty much a basketball-only academy. Well, we, where I work now, it's kind of unique. It's, it's a company, it's a for-profit uh, school system that has 81 schools in 30 countries. So I wasn't even familiar with a for-profit type of school. You know, I'm a guy that did bingo and sold candy and, you know, at a Catholic school. But I, I learned the business side of education and the company I was with, we, they had purchased a school in Las Vegas. Mm -hmm. And when I went out there, they had, you know, really no sports going on. A lot of times when they were purchasing schools, that was other company called Meritas. They were purchasing schools that weren't doing very well. Right. And they would buy the, the business side. And of course, they typically would get rid of the athletic director, the heads, the, anybody that drove enrollment. So we, you know, I started placing my people there. But I always wanted to, to try to do an academy of some sort. And I saw a perfect opportunity there to build something, but do something right. And I knew of a you know, guy there told me, hey, there's a guy out here named Cliff Finley that owns uh, all these car dealerships. And his son happened, you know, played for a prep school. And he would probably be interested. I don't even know if you know the backstory. So I go and meet with Cliff and, and he says, well, I, I said, I started telling him what I want to do. And he said, well, you know, my son played at a prep school. I said, well, where? He said, oh, you've never heard of it. It's in Pittsville, Maine. And I said, not MCI. He said, how do you know them? I said, well, I know the coach there, Max Good. 
Next thing he does, he gets on his phone and calls Max. And his son had played for Max. So they were good friends. I had no clue of this, right? And so now Cliff and I are really, you know, when he, he sent his son there to get better and strength. And I didn't know his son. I had no, I, I didn't know anything about Cliff. So anyway, I, you know, talking to Cliff, he was, Cliff was very kind in the whole Nevada area, mainly Las Vegas. And I said, Cliff, if I do this, I want to do it right. I said, we want funding. I want to be guaranteed we have funding for five years. And so we, you know, he purchased the homes by the school. Uh, he never got involved with it. We, we hired our coaches um, and we did it right. They had to go to school. They would cross the street and we had great coaches. But the funding was there, Corey. I didn't want to start something and have to worry about funding because our company wasn't going to fund something I wanted to do, right? And, uh, and I guess because, you know, Cliff's son had such, and he told me, he said the experience he had at, at MCI was unbelievable. So there was something, tr- he understood it. And now he thought maybe this would be a good thing. And of course, the marketing that went with it there locally. And we never, although Cliff is big with UNLV, you know, he's a former player. Uh, his son may have even played there. But Cliff was a great player there back in the day. He never, we were never told or had to steer our kids there. We said we wouldn't do that. This would be open recruitment until the kids said, if the kids said, I want to go to X school, then we would tell everyone no. So there was never about you're going to go to UNLV or, or a school in that area. So Cliff didn't have an agenda. He just believed so much in the power of the prep school because of what it did for his own son that he was willing to give back to the community. And it, it really helped our school. You know, we, um, we did, that was the only academy I started there was the basketball. And then we built all the other programs and enrollment went up and just a great situation. It was a great experience because again, there wasn't a lot of the academies out there. We were still competing against the Oak Hills and then Montverde got into the game, which, you know, Montverde's 12 miles from where I'm sitting right now. So I'm very familiar with those guys. Um, and it was just fun to watch and, and the, and the players again, and, and the coaches we had, you know, they, you know, they were, we weren't going to take a bad kid, right? Now I'm not talking an athlete. I'm talking just a bad person. Academically, they had to show that they can do that. And they, and, and again, we, you had to be a good player. We wanted a good player there, but academically you had to be willing to work and you're going to be a good person. And I think in, seven or eight years, there was only one kid ever asked to leave that, that program. And uh, so these kids came in and, and, you know, the coaches that were flocking in to recruit them was amazing. You see more college coaches going to the prep school routes now because they want a kid that can play now. And how many high school kids outside of the five stars, the four stars can play right away. College coaches, as you well know, they're, their, their contracts are short-lived. What did you do for me lately? So there is a lot of pressure for college coaches to win, and they go to the prep school route for that. They know they've got a kid that has been, like you mentioned earlier, they're playing against 12 other probably great players right now. Whether they're starting or not, they're getting better, and they can see them in their system. And that's what happened to us with Finley Prep. Yes, you mentioned the kids went to the NBA, but all of our kids signed Division One. On every single one. We didn't have one player in the seven or eight years that signed below a division one and wow. kids that made impacts right away to their programs. Because I mean, every kid on our team could play anywhere in the country on a high school team. They would have been our best player by far at Alexan Catholic or where I'm at now, but they, they all bought into it. They knew at the end of the day, you were going to end up at this school or you're going to be, you know, access to that we we were big into the strength training the academics now we had a short thing kind of like img it was a we did the core classes you had the 16 core classes that you needed but again our practices were absolute amazing you know i tried to actually get my boss to let me move out there i wanted to i was flying out there twice you know with two or three times at least a month and during the season i'd go out a lot and I go to a lot of their games and they were traveling. Nike picked them up, um, got offered a massive contract with Under Armour that we stuck with Nike because they were very loyal to us. You know, as you get better, things get better, right? So it, it was a great experience. And again, 
Cliff was such a kind-hearted person, but it only came about because of his experience of his own right. son. Period. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that it, crazy? It, it, it Max was. Good. I'm, Max Good. Well, Max Good. Here, here we are, Max Good, you know, with, uh, touching that. But, you know, Max, I don't know how long he did MC. I want to say 12, 13 years maybe. Um, but he was amazing what he did at the prep school route and the kids he had were just, uh, just amazing. And he, you know, there wasn't a lot of things to do and get in trouble in, in Pittsville, Maine, grant you. And, and Max is a type of guy that you, you can't tell Max he can only have 20 hours of practice. I know. Cause there, there may not be anyone living that, that has as much love for the game of basketball that Max Good does. I mean, he studies it to this day. He's, he, he watches games every night. He just can't let it go. Where I'm a little different now. I really, I, I love it, but I struggle going to a high school game at nighttime because it, it's kind of when you're a parent and you have a child and now they're 16, 17 coming in and you worry, you, you don't sleep once you have a child. You know, you, that's just the way it is. I have a hard time going to a game and I start reliving that game every play. I'm not criticizing the coach, but I say, what would I do in that situation? Or how would I, or, or things that I'm seeing, if I go to a game and I see some, I've seen coaches coach with hats on. I've seen coaches coach not the way we were, you know, right. the way that we all prepared for it. And I, and I really struggle. I can go to a game at 12 o'clock, 1 o'clock. By that time, my mind has settled down, but I don't sleep. It drives me crazy when I go home because I, I replay the game. Because, you know, when you coach, you just don't go home, put the kids to bed and go to bed. You know, you're up watching films, you're studying, you're worried about your practice the next day. And so it's, it's, it's still difficult for me, and it's been 10 years. But what I do now in my world, I've got a lot of former players that coach and the guys that I hire that coach, I win when they win, right? Yeah. Hell, I win when you win. You get a kid at school, I win because of what you're doing. So that, that to me is what this whole deal is all about, the coaching. Yeah, and I'm just thinking, you mentioned this, Max Good. Think about Max Good. Without Max Good, there's probably no Lexington Catholic dominance. Without Max right. Good, there's no prep athletics. There's no Brad Miller. Without Max Good, there's not all these basketball academies across the nation right now. So think about how Max Good, his family tree, how it's spread out. And just I've yeah. just now made that connection. That's just that's amazing. And I was just talking to Max yeah, yesterday. I, I didn't know that you didn't know that, but that's that I'll never forget because Cliff Finley, everybody knows Cliff out of that area. He literally hit I don't know what number on his phone, and boom, Max answered the phone. Because again, Max was at UNLV and Cliff yeah. and them were very close. Matter of fact, I found out that Max lived in Cliff Finley's basement for six months, lived in his house. And so, but when Cliff Cliff told me, he said, I'm very interested in this because of the experience that my son had at a prep school. And again, I, and I, I knew a little bit about a lot of the prep schools. I said, where? He said, well, you've never heard of it. When he told me, I said, oh, my God. So we were we became very good friends over that. And of course, trust me, there was a lot of Max Good stories that came out of all of this. <laughs> and, uh, I thought I was going to have to hire, hire Max Good to be my coach. I uh, know. Well, I'd love to have Max on the podcast, but it would be banned by all platforms uh, yeah, with yeah. his use of that, That's why I couldn't hire him as my coach. I said, the school system, I'm not sure, Max. He said, well, I can get the job if I want. I said, I know you can, but uh, that's not going to happen. <laughs> all right, we're going to finish up on some quick hitters here. Uh, who's all the right. best player you ever played against? Oh, gosh. Uh, probably... Jack Gibbons. Okay. You know, who's the best? Who, yeah. 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 Okay. Goose. Uh, who's the best player you ever coached against? Maybe the maybe the better way to put that is what player lit you up? Um, Who lit me up? My God, there was a lot of those. Um, well, you, Udonam has them very good. You know, post player, we struggle trying to stop. Um, Alan Houston was very special. Uh, just a name to play to Kentucky, Richie Farmer was, you didn't, you know, Richie's going to get 40 on you every, every day. Uh, but yeah, those, those were some of the, the better ones and tougher ones that I, I faced. Okay. What was the biggest win of your career? 
you know, on a, on a personal level, at the, at the time it was probably Oak Hill, but obviously winning the state championship for the kids was, was the, uh, we won. I think we still hold the record for the largest victory in that game. Uh, the kids played so well. And so I could have crossed my legs during the state tournament that we won in 2002 and uh, just let, turn those kids loose. They, they, they had it, you know, so um, that, that probably, that was probably one of the bigger ones, obviously the state tournament or Oak Hill Academy. Gotcha. Two great wins. And yeah. last one, what's your favorite movie of all time? Well, you know, everybody's going to say Hoosiers. So it's, uh, how many times have I watched that movie? But I did take my kids. What was the movie uh, that came out with Adolph Rupp? Um, uh, Glory Road. Glory Roads. We were, I was here at coaching my team in, in South Florida and that came out and we were actually playing an event in Kentucky the night it came out and I took our team kids to it. Lo and behold, I didn't realize there was going to be reporters there trying to take the backside of, of who Adolph was and what he was about. And again, they weren't going to get that out of me because I, I only knew Adolph from what I used to as a little boy going in there. I sat in a room one time with Adolph Rupp and, and uh, Bobby Knight when they had the tryouts one time uh, at Memorial Coliseum for, I think, the USA team stuff. So uh, I did that. And then I think, you know, the last game I ever coached when I just retired from coaching, I, I, I got the uh, honor of coaching the Michael Jordan Classic at Madison Square Garden. And had, you know, Kevin Durant was on our team. And mm. it was, uh, you know, I think like 12 guys in that game played in the league. But that was a whole week of, of playing with some of the greatest players and some of the coaches that worked with us. But that was what a unique way to go out coaching at Madison Square Garden. Oh, that's a great way to end, isn't it? Yeah. Well, hey, Danny, thanks so much for joining me on the uh, podcast today. I mean, I, I really credit you a lot for helping my game improve, and I don't think I would have played at the D1 level without uh, Lexington Catholic and everything you did for me. So I want to say on this show officially, thank you for all your guidance and help. And even now, I, I reach out to you. We talk a couple times sure. a year about stuff. So thank you for that. Uh, it's a pleasure having you in my life as a friend and uh, a mentor. Same here, buddy. Tell, tell your mom and dad I said hi. I will. Well, thanks for all listening right. to this episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. Be sure to subscribe on YouTube and all the podcasting platforms, and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Yeah.